so uh, we're here to talk about mobile integrated healthcare. And uh, specifically, we're here to talk about some lessons learned um, from our system um, about how to and how maybe not to do some things. Um, so my name is Doug Hooten. I'm the executive director for uh, MedStar. And uh, Matt Zavatsky probably doesn't need anybody to introduce him. <laughs> Matt's our Director of, of uh, Public Affairs. And uh, together, we uh, oversee um, our mobile integrated healthcare uh, program there in, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. And it's been going on for about four and a half years now. And um, it's fairly robust. So we're gonna talk a little bit about it and some of the programs and how they work and, and specifically um, how some things didn't work and uh, things that you need to sort of watch after. So everybody sort of get comfortable. So I'm going to answer some questions uh, in this session relative to why all this MIH hubbub. I mean, why are why are you here? Why are all this? Why are we talking so much about it? Um, why is it so important? Um, what does it take to do this thing and do it right? Um, which is a lot. Uh, we'll get into that. Um, who should be at the table? How do you measure success, which is very important in these programs since they're uh, just getting started? And what is the right provider type um, to be doing this? So we hope to accomplish all of this in the couple of hours that we have with you guys. Um, sort of uh, informal, if you have questions, please uh, just stop us and ask. Uh, we're happy to answer them as we go through the presentation. So um, who's out there doing this? Well, you'll find that everybody is sort of out there beginning to look at this and do this. You get public, you get private, um, and you get a, a fire, and multiple other people are out in the space trying to do this mobile integrated healthcare stuff. Um, who are the healthcare partners, hospitals, payers? Um, and you'll be surprised at what other healthcare uh, providers that are out of the network uh, that want to help you, uh, help them, do their job. So let me just tell you a little bit about MedStar, just so you have some framework of who we are and um, how we're set up. So we're a public utility model. Um, so, so those Jack Stout models started, you know, 30 years ago, um, still going strong. Um, we cover uh, Fort Worth and 14 cities outside of Fort Worth, about 900,000 population. We do about 120,000 responses a year, give or take. And uh, we're an exclusive provider, so that means we do all the ambulance work, non-emergent and emergent, in our service area of 421 square miles. So that's sort of our framework of what we do. We have about 350 employees, about a $36 million budget, sort of unique. We get no tax dollars whatsoever. So public utility model is sort of set up like an airport authority, very similar to that. We have no taxing authority. Um, we work off of user fees only um, to pay for that $36 million. So it's a fully deployed system, um, meaning we don't have any, we have one static station, everybody leaves there and uh, gets a QT coupon when they leave in the morning. <laughs> um, and then they come back in the afternoon. So um, fully deployed. Sort of uh, an interesting concept is our medical control is separate um, from the authority. So uh, our Emergency Physician Advisory Board has representation from the 14 hospitals that are in our, our area. That's where the protocols come from. That's where the clinical practice comes from. They uh, contract with a medical director, uh, Dr. Beeson. You may have heard some of his lectures since you've been here. And, um, you know, it, it has the medical, uh, the medical society is there. Um, the health departments are there. Just about anybody who has anything to do with medicine is in this uh, sort of meeting. So it's a great place to go, to have one forum to talk to people about concepts that you want to try, instead of having to go to individuals and try to convince them. So we're fairly lucky in that we have this uh, sort of base. So why did we do this? Matt's going to tell you why we did this, <laughs> and we truly did have butterflies when we started. We started these programs uh, in 2009, actually the summer of 2009. There are many people in MedStar, Dr. Beeson, Dr. Griswell, who was the medical director at the time, um, and I came to MedStar in 2008, and a lot of us had the conversations often, and Doug has for 
many people in the room have talked for years about are there things that we can be doing different for our patients. In Texas, summers are a bit of a beatdown, especially in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Our call volume increases dramatically in the summertime. Um, MedStar had struggled for quite a while of, of meeting some response time standards, and that's why one of the reasons the authority actually took it over completely. And we were facing another busy summer, so we all kind of got together and said collaboratively, maybe we can start doing some of this testing of this concept of helping patients navigate the system and start with our highest utilizers. At the time, we had one paramedic who was a seasoned paramedic in our system who was on light duty. He was able to lift a cardiac monitor, <coughs> excuse me, but he couldn't lift a patient. And he was a very, uh, again, seasoned paramedic in the system. His name was Bo. This is his Texas. And so we came up with the idea with, with Dr. Beeson, Dr. Griswell, and the Medical Control Authority to try this this summer. Maybe if we can take some of those unnecessary calls out of the system, we can improve some performance, make some more resources available. So we identified some of those patients that we might be able to help manage better through the healthcare system to have them no longer use us as their primary care center, which is really what they were doing. So we identified about 23 patients that accounted for 2,000 calls a year. We all knew these patients. All the patients knew Bo and, and Dr. Beeson. So we started working with those folks. But more importantly, we also wanted to test the water. We'd been doing all the reading. We'd been doing all of the, you know, uh, trying to figure out where the healthcare system is going. And we thought that taking the Wayne Gretzky approach to EMS and healthcare would probably be better than what we'd done forever. And for those of you that aren't aware, Wayne Gretzky is famous for saying, one of the reasons I'm such a great hockey player is I skate to where the puck is going to be. Everybody else is skating to where the puck is. So we'd really wanted to test that water to see if this actually was something that would make sense long term. Part of the reasoning behind that is we have very pure data and had been watching data over time and began to realize that really the th calls that we were responding to the most were not necessarily emergency calls. And a couple of you have seen this in earlier presentations, but as you look at some of the data up on the screen, we realized that a lot of our calls aren't emergencies. And in fact, the fastest growing percentage of our calls in our system are not emergency calls. So how do we plan for the future when the high acuity calls are decreasing as a percentage of our call volume and the low acuity calls are increasing as a percentage of our call volume? At the same time, we're hearing things from CMS and other payers that there's going to be things like accountable care organizations and bundled payments and all those things that might dramatically impact how we get paid for these services. So we felt that we really wanted to try this and that MedStar was a perfect petri dish to really try this concept. We had great community collaboration, we had great community trust, very pure data, um, and a very innovative medical director and leadership team that were really, de really desirous of getting some of these programs off the ground. In developing this thought, we went back to the EMS agenda for the future. And one of the grandfathers, I'm sorry, one of the authors of that document is actually here in the room with us in the back of the room. You can probably recognize him by the gray glow coming from the corner. But um, I, yeah, I'm going to get paid back for that, aren't I? Yeah, okay. Um, Jerry was part of this team. And as you look at some of the highlighted words there, we were always thinking or being thought of as being this community resource integrated with the entire healthcare system, providing preventive services and intervening to prevent that 911 call. So we really took this to heart in 2009 and earlier when we started planning these out because this is really where we think we're going to bring that true value. Then about the same time, IHI and others began to publish the IHI Triple Aim. Don Berwick was the CEO at the time um, and was transitioning into his CMS role. And as you look at how these programs impact the healthcare system, but more importantly impact the patient, we felt that doing these programs would really meet that IHI Triple Aim. And several of you um, have heard about this a lot this week. Um, but again, if you leave with nothing else from this session, knowing this language and this vernacular is going to help you in the future when you're doing or considering any of these types of programs. Then came along the Affordable Care Act. So we've been doing these programs about three years. When the Affordable Care Act was finally passed and then ratified by the Supreme Court as constitutional, in fact, Doug and I and Dr. Beeson and one or two others were at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in Rockville, Maryland, the day that the Supreme Court made the ruling that, in fact, the Affordable Care Act is constitutional. So we kind of uh, will always have that in our checkbox that we were there. 
We were there with a sea of researchers when they're all looking at their Blackberries, because nobody in federal government has iPhones, by the way, and they're all looking at their Blackberries trying to figure out, you know, what is the real ruling from the Supreme Court. That was kind of interesting. But this is all how our world is changing, and we need to be able to prove that we can make a difference in the patient's outcome, we can improve their patient experience, and reduce cost. All of the things that you're hearing as part of that IHI triple aim. We also had been approached by a number of our hospitals over time to help them with the issues that they were having, and you've heard about some of these already, but let's focus for a minute on the last bullet there, the Medicare spending per beneficiary. This is the thing I believe that will truly tip some of those hospitals that may or may not have been willing to do some of this with you guys in the past to really look at this down the road. This year, Medicare is reviewing cost data for hospitals that discharge patients from the hospital and what is the cost, what is the spend of Medicare for that patient post-discharge. So if the hospital discharges patients quickly, but those patients go to LTAC, so they go to high acuity home care settings, so they go to other high dollar expensive types of resources for care, and that hospital's Medicare spending per beneficiary post-discharge is higher than average, then in 2015 they now have the opportunity for an additional penalty. As you know, they're getting um, bonuses or penalties based on value-based purchasing. Dr. Garza talked a lot about that yesterday. They're getting bonuses or penalties based on readmission rate. This is now their third opportunity for bonuses or penalties based on the spending per beneficiary post-discharge. So now we've got several of our hospitals in our community that have now really come back to us in earnest and said, hey, we really want to partner with you guys and we're willing to fund it because we believe probably that this is going to come back and bite us, much like some of the other programs that Medicare has done has done the same thing. And there's just some references to it. So it's been widely published, so it's a big deal for the hospitals. At the second paragraph there, you'll see the quote, it holds hospitals accountable for the cost of some outpatient post-acute care. So this is coming out now. The hospitals know that the, the data that CMS is collecting this year will be used against them next year. So they're trying to do things quickly this year to reduce that spend. And I like this. This was part of the same article at the end there. The conclusion, or the, uh, the author, um, Foster, Nancy Foster, said that my conclusion is that the work hospitals have initiated, but they're going to be reaching out to other non-traditional post-acute care providers, i.e. EMS. Because we serve a unique, we can serve a unique gap in that transition for them. We talked a little bit yesterday about the waste and the, the uh, spending for um, patients in the healthcare system in Massachusetts, but a third of our spending is, uh, in their estimation, wasteful, unnecessary ER visits, unnecessary admissions. So this is part of the space that we're operating in and we're working with our hospitals to reduce that. This was something that just came out this week. And there was a panel of CEOs interviewed by a company that does this on a regular basis and the CEOs are now finally saying that these large healthcare systems, they have a little more clarity now. So a couple of years ago when they were interviewed, they were all nervous, scared, not sure where the world was going. Now they understand it better. But they're clearly indicating the fact that their ability to manage patients out of the hospital is gonna impact them severely and they need to reach out to new transformative leaders to help them do that. Those transformable, transform, uh, the innovative leaders <laughs> are here in this room. So when you leave here today, you're gonna know more than probably 99% of the rest of the EMS world, so you can help your hospitals with that transformation. So we, when we started it, we just wanted to make sure that we were ahead of the annihilation. You guys have learned through the entire, if you've been here for a couple of days, you've learned all of the challenges that we're having and all the things that might be happening bad to us. We believe that by positioning ourselves the way that we have in our community, even if the, the ice age returns, uh, we'll be able to survive until the thaw. It'll be essentially us and the uh, um, roaches that will survive. But um, yes, we will be able to survive that change because we've positioned ourselves as a much more valuable resource than just being an ambulance provider in our community. So it's all about partnerships. I mean, you've sort of, EMS has always been that third service. We're out there, we do what we do. We don't really pay a whole lot of attention to what everybody else does. Um, but this thing requires new partners. This requires you getting to know everyone that you're dealing with to provide that better care at reduced cost. Um, and the object, obviously, is the right resource, right time, right patient, right outcome at the right cost. 
right? I mean, that's all the rights that you could probably put on a screen and not bore people to death. So um, I can't say enough. This is a collaborative effort. Um, absolutely requires you to reach out to others um, and bring people to the table um, to have conversations about this. Um, the great news is you're sort of like Switzerland. You don't have a dog in this hunt, to be honest with you. This is really all their issues that they're trying to deal with. You just have a way to bring everybody together to talk about how we can take care in a sort of continuity of care method um, people in our community. We together. Um, that's what we found, um, and Matt said it, we we're blessed in Fort Worth because we have this very collaborative spirit. I mean, we have very competitive hospital systems. Anybody have competitive hospital systems? All right. So can you imagine getting an HCA uh, and for us a THR and a Baylor Health System um, and JPS, which is our sort of community system, all to come together at one table to talk about common issues? That's hard to do. But in Fort Worth, it happens every month. Every month, these folks get together and talk about common patients because we touch them all, right? We touch, no matter which hospital they go to, they're in our system somewhere. So collaboration is the key word here. So we're going to go through our programs um, and let you know sort of how this all got started and talk a little bit about what we learned um, from those experiences. Now, we started with our EMS loyalty program, our, our high utilization group, HUGS, because they all need HUGS, we found out. And um, these were, as Matt sort of talked about, these were the 10 percenters in our system that were creating most of the volume in our system. And as he stated, started out with some light duty folks, found out that sort of worked, uh, and then we moved that into sort of full programs where we now do proactive home visits on these folks, where we try to educate them about the healthcare system. Um, you'll be surprised at how many people call because they just don't know what else to do. You dial three numbers and what happens? We show up. We show up all, every time. And we show up pretty quick. And if they want to go to the hospital, we take them to the emergency room. And what happens at the emergency room? They get the Salisbury steak, remote control, and a warm blanket. Why not go there? Nice and cozy. So uh, that's what they know. That's all they knew what to do. And um, spending time with them and talking about other things that they might do. How you connect with, in our community, it's uh, JPS Connect, which is the community program. 42 clinics all around the community. All you have to do is get connected, right? But that just get connected piece was fairly complex. And so when you're in the emergency room, getting your, after you finish your Salisbury steak, you watch the movie you want to watch, and your blanket's now gotten cold, the resident or physician will come in and say, you know, you need to follow up with your doctor, which they don't have. And then they'll say, well, just, just go to the JPS clinic. And so they might do that. And then they get rejected at the clinic because they're not connected, right? They haven't been put into this clinic system. And then there's all this paperwork and all this bureaucracy that occurs to get into the system. It's very difficult. So all of our folks now know how to navigate the uh, JPS system. So we can get with these folks. We can get them connected and get them to a clinic. Sounds pretty interesting. Um, so we get them enrolled in available programs, all kinds of programs. How many of you have ever made somebody who had a toothache? Right? You've been in EMS long enough, you had to have made somebody who had a toothache. Hurts, they want to go to the emergency room, so they go to the emergency room and what happens? They get three days of antibiotics, three days of pain meds, and they're told to see a dentist. Well, they don't have a dentist, nor do they have money or access to a dentist. So what happens after three days? They call 911 because their tooth still hurts. And it's this big circle that could just continues. What if you could connect them the first time they called with a dentist? And they never, ever called you again because their tooth hurt, because their tooth got fixed. And they didn't go to the emergency room. So it's all about finding you know, a medical home for these folks, finding a place that takes care of their issue um, right then and there. 
we give them a 10-digit access number instead of the 911 number. You have an issue, call this number. It goes to our mobile uh, healthcare practitioner who answers the phone and who can talk to them, talk them through whatever the issue is that they're having, get them connected somewhere, um, whether it's shelter, it's medical. You know, a lot of our issues are social, so most of these are social issues. Um, they become case managers to help, you know, navigate them to places where they can get food and shelter and medicine and being taken care of. So they're flagged in our uh, computer-aided dispatch uh, system, our CAD, and um, so we know when they call that it's them. So they still get a 911 response because you never know. Some of these folks have lots of comorbidities, so they really could be sick, um, but they also get the mobile health care practitioner. Generally what happened is the ambulance will arrive, the practitioner will arrive, the practitioner will take over, the ambulance will leave. A lot of times when the uh, mobile health care practitioner arrives, the patient will see them arrive and say, never mind, they're just not going to take me to the hospital. They get out of the ambulance and leave. So it's not about not taking people to the hospital, not taking care of them. It's just finding a new way to do that instead of putting them in an ambulance and taking them to the hospital. So um, we do this for a, a period of time until we can sort of establish whether they're going to be successful or not successful. And when they're not successful and they're not compliant, um, we put them into sort of a system abuser status. They don't get the proactive visits um, anymore. Um, the medical director assigns them a hospital, one hospital, that's all they get to go to. The hospital has a, a very strict protocol for them when they get there, which does not include the Salisbury steak, remote control. They still get the warm blanket, I think. <laughs> um, I have to emphasize that only the medical director makes that decision. It's not the paramedic on scene. It's not the community health paramedic. The community, they give them an assessment of the patient, and, um, and then he makes a determination, do they even go to the hospital? You know, we just saw you an hour ago, and you look exactly the same an hour ago that you do now. So he may very well choose to not send them to the hospital, but refer them to their medical home. And then we follow up with them to make sure they went. So two different statuses. This program has worked pretty well. I'll show you some numbers. Um, again, this was sort of self-serving for us. It was how do we deal with these high utilizers of our system um, differently than we were in the past. It started out with light duty folks and has morphed into this program. Um, but this program is relatively unfunded. That's how we got, and even today, it is mostly unfunded. Um, and so it's sort of a helping ourself sort of issue. Um, so keep that in mind. So here's sort of the numbers. It's been about 340 people enrolled in that. And let me just tell you something about our data. When we report data, we report data so that we have 12 months before, 12 months during, and 12 months after. So it's very pure data. So we, we know what happened with them before, during, and after. And those are the patients that we report our data on, all of it. So 74 graduated patients, 12 months data, and I just told you all of that. Um, during enrollment, 30 to 90 days, there was a 20% reduction in, um, in their use of 911. Now this was about 40%, but we've now increased the number of patients that are going through this um, to include high utilizers from the hospital side, not just the EMS side. Um, so we're having to revamp our program some to figure out how to better deal with those folks. Um, so, uh, but you can see post-graduation that almost 83% of those have a reduction in using 911. That's a big number. And that's for a long period of time after they graduate. And it all comes from educating them about the system. <coughs> so here's... Here's a real patient. This is um, uh, uh, Anton. And Anton is, um, is a guy that was calling frequently, almost daily, for an ambulance. These are his statements. Um, and I think they're, they're fairly um, moving when you read them. It's even better when you talk to him and hear how these programs have sort of changed his life. Um, 
And, the, and it says, before I started the program, I was sick every day. He's going to the emergency room every day. And he says, he learned more in the last three months from John. John's one of our uh, mobile health care practitioners um, and probably Marissa. And I have uh, learned from the doctors, the hospitals, and emergency rooms. It's because we take the time to sit down with them and talk about their disease process, to talk about what's causing them to have these problems. This made a significant difference in this guy's life. And um, he has been very successful um, to date so far. So we move on to 911 nurse triage. So here is another thought um, that sort of occurred to us. Because you saw the number, about 37% of our, our calls that come in are sort of low acuity. Um, what do you do with those calls? What do you do with them today? What do you do with low acuity calls that come in your system? I have an M&M stuck in my kid's nose. Do you tell them it melts in your mouth, it also melts in your nose? No, you send an ambulance, right? Because they call 911. Low acuity calls, what do you do with them? So um, how, do you, how can we better address those issues? So it was really about um, how do we navigate these patients to better sources of care than ambulances to emergency rooms. Now, one would argue, this is a sort of lesson learned if you like, um, this is sort of counterintuitive, because how do we get paid? In our industry today, how do we get paid? Transporting patients, right? You call, we haul, we get paid. Well, we have an opportunity to get paid. Let's leave it there. So if somebody calls and we go out there and we don't transport, what happens? You don't get paid, right? Unless, of course, they're um, dead and CMS has been gracious enough to pay us for not transporting those, relocating those corpses to the emergency room, right? They figured out that that's a cost reduction strategy for them, believe it or not. That's why they did that. It costs a lot of money to take that patient to the emergency room and have them get a level five sort of charge um, when the person is not salvageable. Make sense? Interesting that they knew that all along. So uh, these are low acuity calls. Um, we use Clawson's system. Um, have, we're an ACE accredited sy uh, system, have been for years. Um, so when they come out alpha and omega, that's the low sort of stuff, they get a very warm handoff um, to a nurse that's in our call center. Sits right next to our 911 folks. And it's all about um, how can we help you? How can we assist you with whatever your issue is today? Um, <clears throat> she has this clinical decision-making software that we get from, um, from Clawson, and it works very well. It's been tested on millions of patients um, you know, around the world. It's sort of coming here. You know, we, we tried it in uh, Kansas City when I was in Kansas City, and um, they're doing it in Louisville, tried it in Richmond. I mean, it's, it's not like it's something really, really new, um, but it's always struggled here in the States, and it struggled here in the States because you've got to have some place to send these folks, right? So in Kansas City, it worked fine, just didn't have any place to send them. There was no referral sources, so you end up having to send them where? Well, you send them to the emergency room. Well, if you're going to take them to the emergency room, save yourself some time and just send an ambulance and you'll get paid. Sort of that's sort of the scenario that happened uh, when I was in Kansas City. In Richmond, you know, much the same, I think, Jerry would probably could speak to that, is you've got to have good referral sources. The program works fine, but if you have no place to send them, you don't have dentists, you don't have clinics, you don't have places to send them, it will fail. Um, so this is sort of how the eligibility is determined. It's determined by local medical control authority, you know, how those responses are done. Um, very medically controlled. <clears throat> Again, the key is referral networks. You have to engage the hospital and community partners. We did, and what we found was they were willing to fund this program. They actually pay for the nurse. We pay for the infrastructure, they pay for the nurse, 
All the hospitals in the area split it. Those four competing hospitals split this. And so what we found is, here's another lesson learned, what we thought we were going to do for them was stop bringing them these patients and we would save them money. That's our thought was we were going to save them money. We were very early in this. Eventually the partners told us that you don't really save us any money. It's not what this is about. I still have the same infrastructure, I'm not laying off any nurses, right? These five or ten patients that you're taking out here doesn't change my equation. However, it does improve our opportunity on our um, Prescani scores, our top box scores. Because if they never come to the emergency room, guess what they don't get? They don't get a survey. These low acuity patients go where when they get to the emergency? They think they're going to go in the back, but where do they really go? They go to triage. And in these big cities like ours, on busy days, they could spend six, seven, eight hours um, in the waiting room before they get back to see the doctor. And only to be told, well, you have a toothache, you should go see a dentist. Right? Maybe they don't get the pain meds they want. Whatever. And then when they go home, what do they get? They get a price candy score. Are they happy? No. So it dings the hospital um, for those stuff. That's their value equation, something we hadn't even thought of as we went through it. So 42% of referral patients, referred patients uh, end up going to alternative destinations. So half the patients that get referred to this system almost end up someplace other than an emergency room by ambulance. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So how do they get where they're going? Sometimes it's a taxi. Sometimes it's a bus, right? We have these uh, bus passes we give them for 24 hours. So they can go to their doctor's office, to the pharmacy, and to the liquor store. It's good for 24 hours, right? Sometimes we find that one of their biggest issues is they don't know how to use the bus route. So what do we do? We teach them how to use the bus route. Literally get on the bus with them, show them all their stops on how they can get someplace. Is that clinical? No, it's sort of social service oriented, case management, isn't it? So you have to keep all this stuff in mind. These things really work. They really do work but it is a lot of work, and it's all about case management. So we have a congestive heart failure readmission reduction program. Has anybody heard about that? You've been at this conference. I'm sure somebody has mentioned it, right? <clears throat> so these programs, uh, you know, are at risk for readmission, um, and they get referred to us by cardiac case managers. But this all came up um, because we had good success with our hug patients, our high utilizer group. Some cardiologists indicated, you know, we got this issue coming up where they're going to, uh, we're going to get bonuses or penalties based on how we get these readmission things. And when it first started, it was sort of, you know, all cause, it, was, it was all, wasn't all cause readmissions, but it was for readmissions for that. And CMS figured out that it had to be all cause um, to make it work. And then the hospitals weren't, weren't getting paid for it. And now they sort of get paid for it because they whined about it. But, but at the end of the day, um, this was a significant issue for them, and they said, you know, I think your program might help us with this. And so it got started. Um, and um, I can tell you that it went through many iterations before we got it right. Many iterations. Before it was, we took everybody. Come one, come all. One through fours. Um, we found that we were increasing the number of readmissions and hospital transports. As we educated people about their disease process and what it was all about, they actually called more. So that was sort of wrong because there wasn't anything we could do for them really when we arrived. They were sick, they had gained weight, they had to go back to the emergency room to get what? Typically diuresed, right? And then they would get admitted for observation. So we sort of revamped that program um, and decided that we had to do something different. And so now we have a very formal in-home education program. Um, we assess them, we take vital signs, we get all this baseline data, um, and then uh, we give feedback to their primary uh, care physician. So it's very important that in this program that you have that connection 
with their primary care, whoever's going to be taking care of them, you've got to have that connection. So you can't get in our program unless we have the back door into your primary care doc, and he is going to work with us collaboratively in order to manage this patient. That means usually he gives us his cell number. And they answer the cell when we call in order to manage their patients. They get a non-emergent, that 10-digit number for, you know, episodic care so they can call and talk to us about stuff that's going on. They get these frequent home visits. Um, when they're decompensating, we refer them to their primary care docs early. We recognize it, we see it, and we refer them early. We do now do in-home diuresis. So when they go to the emergency room, what happens to them? They get diuresed. And typically they'll either get sent home, put in 23-hour ops, or admitted. Now we just do a Chem 8 there at the bedside, talk to the doctor, up their Lasix, um, either PO or start an IV, give them Lasix, DC the IV, check on them, do more Chem 8s, contact their primary care doc, and most of these people do very well just sitting at home. The in-home education isn't just about sitting at a table and talking to people. It's about looking in their trash can. It's about looking in their cabinets, looking in their refrigerator. What are they eating? Right? And, and it's not telling them what they can't eat. It's helping them find alternatives. So if you like canned green beans, is a good example. You like green beans, but you eat them canned. We suggest to you, you could eat green beans. How about fresh frozen? Why? Because the sodium load that's in a, in, a, in a can of green beans is too high. You could still have your green beans. Try this. And here's how you cook them, by the way. So um, it's a very involved program, very successful. Um, and, and the third time really was the charm for this. Because, again, we reduced that population to just twos and threes, uh, class twos and threes of, of CHF. Um, ones, we found, needed very minimal interventions. Fours, we almost couldn't help. You know, they were just, they have multiple co comorbidities and they were very difficult. <clears throat> so for the 28 patients that are enrolled now, we've had no 30-day readmissions, no 60-day readmissions, and no 90-day readmissions. These programs really, really do work. And who's doing it? Well, it's doing it. an EMS agency is doing that. So what about the patients that are in um, observational status? You ever see those? It's becoming a bigger and bigger issue. So instead of admitting the patient, where do they put them? They put them in an observational place because that's not considered a readmission. Hospitals are fairly smart. Right? And they get paid for that. Well, we were working with, uh, we partnered with a, our accountable care organization. Um, their ED case and case managers identify eligible patients. And then they um, refer them, those people who are qualified, they will refer those patients to us, discharge them to us. We'll monitor throughout the night and then connect them with their physician within, you know, if it's a Friday, it could be Monday. If it's a Tuesday, it could be Thursday, but typically a very short window that we monitor them. Our nurse will follow up with them. Our uh, uh, mobile and credit uh, healthcare practitioners will follow up with them. They have the 10-digit number to give us a call, and um, we sort of walk them through, and they don't end up in observational status. <clears throat> so we've had 68 patients enrolled, three patients revisited prior to uh, their follow-up, there's been about a $7,800 savings uh, to the payer per patient. That's not our number, that's their number. It's what they reported back to us, that they're saving per encounter. So think about that. If they're saving $7,800 for these encounters, is there an opportunity for you to collect some of these dollars? And the answer is, yes, they pay us for these programs. <clears throat> Hospice. Anybody have hospice agencies in your, your area? This is a great program. Um, a lot of your stage four congestive heart failure patients, by the way, end up in hospice. That's where they end up. So they're getting a lot of congestive heart failure patients. And guess what they want help with? 
managing the class four patient that's now under their care. So we've sort of morphed from doing away with the, the class fours to now having to deal with them again, but dealing with them in a palliative care scenario as opposed to um, in some other way. So we, these are visits at home. We counsel, instruct, give them the 10-digit number. We register these patients in our CAD. We co-respond uh, on a 911 call. So if they call 911, we know it's them. Uh, we send a response because not all hospice calls are hospice related. Somebody falls and breaks their arm. That's not a hospice call, right? That's just a medical call. It's a regular old 911 call, and we would transport them to the hospital, which is why we send a 911 response. But we also send the mobile integrated health care. The hospice nurse is loaded in the CAD when it comes up. They call the hospice nurse. She gets a heads up. She heads that way. The mobile integrated health care pr uh, practitioner heads that way. Uh, we get this big response. Ambulance goes away. Practitioner stays. Um, tries to calm everybody down because, you know, the end of life is sort of difficult. Um, for it's difficult for anyone, but if you're not trained in this stuff, um, when people start to guppy breathe and do that sort of stuff, it's scary. Scary stuff. Um, they have palliative, palliative care kits that they have in the refrigerator. Morphine, whatever their doctors have given them. The hospice agencies give them. Our folks can give that met. So they can make the patient comfortable. And then they give the family Versed to keep them comfortable. Just kidding on the Versed. But, but it, the point is, it's to keep everybody calm until the hospice nurse arrives and then we leave. That's our part in this. And for that, they pay us. And they pay us when the patient has had a very successful journey. And what is a successful journey for a hospice patient? Up or down, whichever way the staircase may go for them, right? So here's some stats. It's 125 enrolled, uh, referrals, 103 enrolled, because um, they can elect to be in the program or not be in the program. 66% um, died, 22 are still active, two got, two got better, <laughs> which is always good, I guess. And uh, we've had 11 that voluntarily disenrolled. So a very, um, very successful program um, in, in dealing through this. Now, again, lessons learned, right? So this is a very low acuity issue for us. Um, but working through um, with your partners and exactly the payment methodology around that, uh, we have found to be interesting. <laughs> right? Because they, you know, uh, this hospice revocation issue, which is big, you know, revocation is when somebody either voluntarily removes himself or the hospice agency removes them from hospice care. It could go either way. Typically happens when you call 911 and they go to the emergency room, family panics, third cousin from California comes in, doesn't like it, big squabble, and they end up revocating. So they lose revenue, future revenue. Plus, they got to pay for that, that hospital part of whatever that was. So the emergency room, the ambulance, and all of that is part of it. So it's a big spin for them. Um, some estimates, somewhere around ten to $15,000 per revocation. So why are they interested in this? Because it's a big spin for them. They need to learn how to control this. And where does this control point happen? Typically, they call 911. So if you can control it at the 911 point, um, you can have better success with this. So just, just a note on those stats for a second. Um, the criteria for having the case manager enroll a, or refer a patient for enrollment into this program is that the case manager for hospice believes that this patient's family is going to voluntarily disenroll, voluntarily disenroll from the program. So they have loved the results because if you look at that 10 or 11 percent of the patients, they believed 100 percent of those patients were going to voluntarily disenroll. Now they have another 300 patients on service that they don't have any concerns about. Families committed, the patients committed, they don't refer those patients to us. These are the high risk patients that they believe the families are going to call 911, revoke from the program. So for them, when they see a 10 percent or 11 percent revocation rate, on a population that they thought they would have a 100% revocation rate on, they love this program and have asked us to expand it significantly. 
great program, low utilization from the EMS side, um, generates revenue, easy to do. So here's one that's really new for us. We just signed these contracts last month. Um, and this is with a home health care agency. So one might think when you do these programs, this would be your enemy, right? Because you're trying to invade their space. This is things that they do. They take care of patients at home, right? It's not something we do. We like to consider ourselves transitional care folks, not home health care workers. That's not what we're here for. Um, and so we worked with this, this, this group to put together a program that's now a collaboration to support their program. Why? Well, because they have the same issue everybody else does, resource issues. So at night, they might have one nurse on call. She might be tied up on another patient when a call comes in. Um, and they don't have the resource for it. So we service their backup. We go out, assess the patient, contact the nurse or doctor, and say, here's what's going on. What would you like us to do with this patient? Um, took some sort of uh, additional uh, training for the people um, about wound vacs, how to deal with wound vacs, because um, apparently they break down quite a bit. Our, go our group is really good with duct tape. <laughs> um, and um, Foley maintenance and our congestive heart failure protocol. They have a lot of patients now entering home health that have congestive heart failure. They need a way to deal better with these patients uh, than they currently have because you get different levels of nursing skills inside of a home health care agency. Some really, really good, some really, really not so good. In fact, uh, our experience with home health has been that sometimes they're our biggest referral source. Somebody comes home from the hospital from a CHF adventure, the first hospice, I mean the first home health visit is, wow, you look really sick. And what do they do? They send them back to the emergency room. And they're like, yes, they're sick, they're a congestive heart failure patient, they're fine. And then they come back. So um, another good partnership, this is all about partnerships, it doesn't have to be adversarial. Bring people to the table. These are not folks that we would normally deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in EMS. We just wouldn't do it. Um, we deal with them because we respond to calls there, but not in a proactive, collaborative method where we can support their operations. So it doesn't have to be adversarial. So those are our programs that we currently run, and we have more that are coming up. You might ask, you know, I don't know, you know, where do you begin this stuff? How do you get started? Right? So I'll let Matt tell you because he Doug likes to break. talk. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So where to begin? Organizational readiness. Is <clears throat> your organization able to do this? Not every EMS agency, not every fire department, not every hospital-based EMS system is going to be able to do this. You need to build some organizational will. You need to make sure your medical director is committed. You need to make sure that your state EMS authorities are committed. You need to make sure that you have some willing partners in the community and that those partners in the community are willing to trust you to do something that in many cases, certainly in your community, may have never been done before. Do you have those relationships built? Is your organization ready to do that? Is there a gap that you can fill in the community? We tell people all the time. We get phone calls, emails, carrier pigeon messages to the window. It says, hey, we're going to do a CHP program, a CHF program, we're going to do whatever program, can you give us your protocols? Say, well, okay, let's back up. What type of program are you going to do? Well, we're just going to do a CHP program. We're going to do a mobile health program. Okay, but what, what are you going to do? Well, we're going to train all of our people and we're going to send them out into the street. Okay, well, stop. What gap are you trying to fill? Because really the question that you need to keep asking yourself is what problem are we trying to solve? If there's no identified need, then maybe there's not a good niche for your program to prove value. So make sure that as you walk into these programs and as you start venturing down this road, that there is a cavern that you can bridge with your program. And that requires asking people in your community. You may think you know, but you may not have a clue. We've helped a, a large ambulance provider in Lafayette, Louisiana, and they thought, yep, yeah, when I talk to our hospitals, it's all going to be about CHF. Well, when they actually went and talked with their hospital, it wasn't. It was about diabetes for them. They had a huge diabetes repetitive ER visit issue. 
So their first gap filling program was a diabetic program, not a CHF program. So you have to engage those partners. Continually ask yourself the can and should question. You can do a lot of things. Should you do some of those things? Again, is that a value that you're going to bring to the community? We talk all the time about our role is not to replace services that are already available in your community because that's where you begin to have some adversarial relationships perhaps with people. You want to find where there is not a service available and fill that gap and help people navigate, as Doug mentioned earlier, to those programs that are available to them they just might not know about. Funding, trying to determine that early. So when we did the congestive heart failure program, the cardiology groups approached us in June of 2010 and one of the very first questions was, okay, we can try this for you and we'll, we'll see how it goes, but if it's successful, and we'll define what success looks like with you so we all can agree on what success is, we'll talk about that in a moment, but are you going to be willing to fund it? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to do what is very counterintuitive, invest a half a million dollars a year or more for the opportunity to build less. Now we're working, we're willing to work with you to bend the value curve for the services that we're providing, but it has to come with some uh, sustainable, if not certainly seed money, but you have to have that commitment up front to make sure that you're going to be able to continue the program. Again, which model are you going to do? Oftentimes that will be based on what that gap analysis shows, what that needs assessment shows. It could be any one of these or something that we hadn't even thought of. It still amazes Doug and I all the time where people call and there are things that they've asked us to take on that wasn't even close to being on our radar screen. We're working right now with USMD. Um, they've come to us through one of our associate medical directors uh, with a program that they'd like us to do that's completely out of our service area and they're quite frankly have said, well, if it costs us money to have you guys go down there and do this program for us, just, okay, let's talk about how much it's going to cost and maybe we'll fund it for you. So that becomes, again, you just never know. But again, go, always go back to that can do, should do kind of discussion to make sure that's one that you're going to do. So we're going to talk about some of the things that we've learned and we're going to start showing our scars. So this is the sort of under the tent look. So you can see where some of the lessons learned as we've gone through this process and Doug and I are going to share some of this because we have some, some different keen insights into these programs. So number one, involve everyone that you can possibly think of into the early discussions. When we began to have this discussion back in really the end of the summer of 09, again, we started very internal, self-serving, just wanted to see if we could alleviate some burden. When we decided maybe this is a gap we can fill in the community, we invited everyone we could think of to the table, literally. All the hospitals, the United Way, the Area Agency on Aging, the home care agencies, the hospice agencies, all the folks that we could think of, we invited to come to get together with us and do this discussion about gaps in the community and asked each one of the people we invited to invite someone because they're probably people we haven't thought of that should be at the table. So again, continually look at doing that. Make sure obviously you've got your internal team in, in place. Talk to all of those folks because as we have found, um, a little tweak over here on a program that seems pretty minor on one side has a huge ripple effect sometimes with your communication center, with your business office, with the billing folks. And uh, make sure that you have this team together that are continually vetting some of the changes that you want to make. We talked about bringing those folks to the table. Uh, elected and appointed officials. When we were starting the nurse triage program, we knew it was going to be totally different than what we, anyone had done in our community in the past. So Doug and I went on the road and we met with all 15 city councils. Talked to them about the program, let them know how it was going to make more resources available for the community. It was going to improve the patient's experience, improve their outcome, and potentially reduce costs for the entire healthcare system and gave them the opportunity to opt out. So if they didn't want the residents of Burleson or the residents of Hazlitt or the residents of Fort Worth to be involved in this program, they had the option to say, okay, we don't want our patients to go, our residents to go into that program. We wouldn't refer their patients. That's fine. Some 74 elected officials, not one no vote. But they wanted to make sure, and you should make sure when you go through this, that for elected and appointed officials, they have the opportunity to put their fingerprints on your program. Because if not, the last thing that they like are surprises. And that you may find an adversary that you didn't necessarily... So let me add something there. Make sure you invite your media partners. Right? We got great media coverage on this sort of out-of-the-box solution where they went out and interviewed people in a bar um, who thought that this was really... I thought it was great that they did it in a bar. Um, they thought this was 
you know, the perfect solution for people wasting stuff. And they, you know, the lead was some lady who had called who had really bad hiccups. And that was her complaint. I got hiccups. Um, and so they play that over and over again. And so it really does foster a better picture of you in your community about what you're doing to bring value. Good. Define the gap that you're going to fill. We talked a lot about that already. We just want to reiterate that fact. But also, what model are you going to do? There are essentially two types of models. There's an urban patient navigation model. That's what ours is. You cannot swing a dead cat by the tail in Fort Worth and the Metroplex without hitting some kind of healthcare resource. But it's still difficult for patients to navigate through that, so we help them with that. If you are in Eagle County, Colorado, and the largest city in your, in your service area has 1,500 residents and you cover 800 square miles, your model will look different. You are going to actually provide primary care services. You may do suturing in the home. You may do a bunch of things for a patient at home because there is no skilled nursing resource available. So you're offering a service that might normally be available, but because of the setting, it is not. So make sure that as you look at the different models, that your program fits the model that's going to be best for your community, whether it's a rural model or an urban model. CMS just announced yesterday, by the way, that they're coming out with another grant round for frontier community health integration. So if you are in a frontier area, Monday, if not this afternoon, or in your very super rural area, start getting together with your healthcare stakeholders and say, hey, I heard about this thing. Do, should we collaborate on a grant to see if this is something that we can do in our rural area because CMS has made rural money available for healthcare integration programs in rural areas? Doug? So, you know, you've got to listen more than you talk. This is, this is easy to go out and try to sell it to people like you're, um, you know, the resident expert on this stuff, but you have to listen to what their issues are because it's not going to be what you think it's going to be. And people are much smarter than you might give them credit for. Um, we don't have all the answers, nor should we have all the answers. The part about this, this collaborative part, is bringing people together and having them ask smart questions that we think can begin to answer um, through this gap analysis of what's important to them. What's important to them? It's not what's important to you. It's if what's going to be important to them. Um, and just so you know, what works in Fort Worth may or may not work in your area. Right? Fort Worth and Texas in general is different. You know, we're, we, we like our guns and we like our barbecue. Those are the two things I can tell you that are very consistent in Texas. Everything else, I'm not so sure about. But but it is a delegated practice state, so it's up to our medical director as to what we do and don't do from a clinical practice perspective. Some states don't have, doesn't have that sort of um, freedom to do that. You may be heavily regulated and might require working with your EMS state agencies to change those dynamics. So just because it works one place, don't think that it's automatically going to work where you are. You have to do the research. You have to, to make sure that you're ready to move. And the point to the little image there is if you see a turtle on a pole, he had help getting there. So we have been very successful with our programs because, boy, we have had a lot of help. And we continue to have a lot of help. We have a great internal team. We have a great medical direction team. We have a great community. And we have great relationships with the healthcare systems in our community. So collaborat collaboratively, we've been able to put that turtle up on the pole because we had a lot of help getting there. Remember to always ask, what problem are we going to solve? That has sort of become a moniker even within our organization. When we have meetings, when we have strategy sessions, let's go back to the root problem. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Sometimes you get so wound up in the process, you forget why you're developing the process. So continually ask your community, ask the physicians, the hospitals, the skilled nursing, the home care agencies, and internally, what problem is it that we are trying to solve and how can we actually bring value to help solve that problem? And if you can't come up with an answer to that question, then don't do the program. Do something different that brings value to that. Avoid, you know, this mission creep thing is not something to take lightly. 
Um, our programs, you know, some of the scars, we talk a little ugly scars. You know, we had a 30-day readmission program that was lasting a year. <laughs> really? A 30-day readmission program that lasts a year? Um, that's not the intended purpose of the program. So you have to refocus. If it's a 30-day readmission program, make it a 30-day readmission program and stick to what you started to do. Otherwise, it becomes just this overwhelming um, thing that you're always trying to manage. And, and we have call, I have calls every day, and Matt has calls every day that comes into the office where somebody wants us to do something. Um, we only have a very finite amount of resource to do that. You can easily get overwhelmed by people's requests after you've been successful with the program um, for, them to, for you to come help them. And then all the stuff that's coming down under the Accountable Care Act, you know, a lot of new stuff comes out in April um, that, that you probably don't even know about yet. Um, and they're all going to be looking for some sort of solution. And if you started being part of that solution, they're going to come to you and want you to do it. You have to be able to say, no, I can't do it right now. I can only take 50 patients. I can't take 1,000. <laughs> Be willing to say no. Or at least not yet. It's always right. a good way to say that and, and figure out how to do it. Establish your value equation early. We took a pause last Monday because we realized that really for the first time, with the exception of the internal referrals that we do for some of the high 911 utilizers, we're at a point in our program development that every patient that's being referred from an external agency into our programs, we are getting paid for. It has taken four and a half years to get there. But we established with our partners early on that A, this is going to have to be sustainably funded in the long term. B, tell us what your costs are for doing the things that you're doing so that we can have some comparison to. So if, we're, if it's costing you X, if we charge you Y, is that going to work for you? And one of the things that you'll hear in a minute is never underestimate the value that you're going to bring to people because it's a lot different than how we've typically done pricing in the past. So ask that question and do not offer a price. When people come to you and say, how much is it going to cost for me to do this? And this is a huge scar that we have that in some cases we are still hemorrhaging from because we're trying to unwind some of these contracts. We failed to, un to estimate or failed to understand the value of the, uh, the impact of the value that we were going to bring to them. So for example, as Doug mentioned, that observational admission avoidance program. We were about to offer a price that was half what they were willing to offer to even begin with. So th thankfully, we were kind of cut off in the beginning before we put our price on the table and they offered us a price twice of what we were, were gonna, going to suggest. But what we have found over time is that the value that we bring to the check writer for these programs is far in excess of the cost of providing the service. So when somebody says to you, how much are you going to charge us for doing this? Your answer back to them should be, how much value does it bring and what are you willing to, re to, re to share with us in that cost savings? Have them be the first ones to put a number on the table. If for some reason it's way below your cost of providing the service, now you can have a conversation. But we have found, generally, that the price that they will offer or the price that they will take is almost mind-boggling <laughs> for some of these programs because they're looking at it in a much different value proposition than typically we might under a unit hour cost analysis, for example. So this four-year program for us where we were spending a half a million dollars a year on the program and getting very little funding for that has now turned into this year in this year's budget for us, it's a million dollars. It's a million dollars of new revenue. Now think about that. It's a million dollars of new revenue. Take out about 600000 in expense. It's $400,000 to the bottom line. Now, I've invested about $2.5 million into this. <laughs> so we're far from breaking even with the program. But to say, to be here to tell you that we're now turning a profit, I guess, and for a governmental entity, it's really more about capital reinvestment into these programs because uh, we don't make profits, um, is amazing. Can you do it? Yes. Um, but I have to tell you up front, just to be transparent, it's going to require capital investment on your part. We now have 13 
mobile integrated healthcare practitioners, um, three vehicles, you know, all the stuff that goes along with that. You have to make the investment um, in order to make this pay out. And for some of these folks, you're going to have to prove the concept, right? Because for them, it's going to be when you talk about this, it's going to seem a little bit like a unicorn. Heard about them, read about them, haven't seen many, right? And so that proof comes from the data, and, and we're going to talk a little more about data, that you're going to generate from this, or you're going to use from somebody else who has generated the data. So, We hear all the time from people in different states that says, well, we can't do this because the state law doesn't allow it. Our almost immediate response back to them is, show us where in your state law it says that you can't do it. We are operating in a totally new space in this environment. The regulators, when they were writing regulation and statutes many years ago relating to EMS, they hadn't contemplated the whole concept of mobile health care. So in most states, there is no regulation that says that you can do this. There's no regulation that says that you can't. Even in our local ordinances that create an exclusive provider model for the MedStar system, it's very clear, ambulance service, exclusive market, and the reasons for it. But mobile health care is not. It's not even addressed because it was never taught. Now we're going to change that. We're going through that painful process now with our attorney. Um, and then we'll have to do it with the cities to incorporate some of that. But the point is that when you get that phone call or, or when you begin researching this, presume that you can unless someone points to a statute for you or a regulation for you that says you can't. Now California being the left coast, they actually have a lot of issues because they have specific regulatory limitations to what their paramedics can do and how they do them. Connecticut is fairly similar, so we're actually going to be helping Connecticut perhaps unwind some of those regulations. But here's an example. We got a phone call from a uh, EMS chief a few months ago and said, now we can't do this because the Florida statute doesn't allow it. So we were able, because Doug and I both came from Florida, we were able to say, no, no, when we were in Florida in 2000 and 1999, we changed the law to specifically allow this to occur because we started thinking about this stuff a decade and a half ago. So in the Florida statute, as you see highlighted there, there's an actual provision that allows EMS agencies to do community health initiatives. Most states don't have this language, which means you can do it. If it's not excluded, if it's not prevented, assume that you can do it and move forward, or what we like to refer to as proceed till apprehended. Um, and remember that this is not expanded scope. This is not expanded scope. For you know, and at least in our system, we respond to about 120,000 responses a year. About 30% of those uh, end up being no transports. Does, same in your systems, right? Do you not transport patients? You assess them and you leave them on scene? How's this different? You're assessing a patient, but instead of just leaving them on scene, you're finding continuity of care for them. You're going that extra step to make sure that they get, they get seen. Our lawyers and our risk folks, our insurance company, when we talk to them about this program, they say, let me, make, let me say I got this right. If you respond to these calls and you leave people on scene with no medical care 30% of the time, and you want to do a program where you don't transport them, but you work with them to find care, yeah, this is a no risk. <laughs> this is a no risk proposition for us. Um, we didn't know it at the time, but the transition from being either a community paramedic or something to a mobile healthcare practitioner um, becomes very important because what we've realized is that it's not just about being a paramedic. It could be about being a nurse or, or a physician assistant or even a physician. Could be a mobile healthcare practitioner uh, in our system in the future. So it turns out that the name um, is more representative of where we believe this mobile integrated healthcare practice is going to go in the future. So in Mesa, Arizona, they have a nurse practitioner that rides with a paramedic on a truck who goes and does this stuff. Very successful program. So there's not just one way of doing this. So the mobile integrated, um, the, the mobile healthcare practitioner name sort of works better because it could be inclusive of everything. And as we push forward with this stuff, we were just talking about this at dinner last night, 
you know, you're, you're, we're beginning to run into um, things that we never thought about. Right? There's some organizations that represent um, healthcare workers, you know, that, that may feel like we're trying to take their space. Right? And so our point behind that's going to be this is a mobile healthcare practitioner, it's inclusive of all practitioners. Um, and then having those people get together and help us develop the standards for that um, and the accreditations that are going to be necessary for that will be great. But there are oppositions out there, whether it's expanded scope issues, um, you know, um, running into organizations that provide health care stuff. Um, it's all there. Um, but we're new to this. We have to be collaborative. We need to bring people to the table. So... Um, how do you select somebody for this? You might ask, who's the right person for this? Here's a scar, right? <laughs> so we thought it was going to be our most senior, you know, experienced paramedics that you could put out there. Turns out we were wrong, right? So what we look for are people who are customer focused, right? So you have that diabetic who um, has its, its hypoglycemic issue, they run out, they treat them, and now they want to refuse. And then their scene time on that is fairly short. They do the refusal and they're gone. Right? So what happens with the diabetic when you fill them up with D50, they don't do anything else, eventually they crash again. So we look for people who have longer scene times. Because you know what we find these people are doing? They're taking care of people. We've even had them cook meals for them to make sure, talk to their doctors, spend time with them to try to help them have better outcomes. These are folks who like to make a difference uh, over a long period of time, right? I mean, they, they like to have these patient engagements. They're not just there for the episodic, you know, um, in Texas we have this hold my beer and watch this followed by a 911 call, right? That happens a lot in Texas. That's never going to go away. It never. Um, and we have a lot of people who just want to do that. That's what they want to do. In fact, 95% of their schooling was all about that. We think that's wrong, by the way. We just sent in some recommendations on the agenda of the future for the EMS education. That's wrong. Because really, 85%, maybe 90% of what they do is not that. It's these low acuity, high frequency sort of events where you need to spend more time with patients. You need to navigate them. You need to get them someplace to get taken care of so we can stop this repetitive cycle of responding to them. You need to look for that person who's in that mindset, who wants to help them um, find a space that they can get taken care of and have good outcomes. <clears throat> Provide the right training. When we went down this road, there was no training program. This was in the fall of 2009. There was not a program that had been developed, so we internally developed a program based on what our local community was saying they wanted these practitioners to do, what gap they wanted to fill. So we put them through uh, an, a, a critical care transport paramedic program because we wanted to ha have them have some additional pathophysiology and some additional disease management training. They were also going to respond to some critical care calls that we had never been doing in the past. So we wanted to have them be able to have that uh, credentialing. But we also developed a curriculum with our social service agencies, with the social workers, with the local mental health, mental retardation organization, with the homeless shelters, with the homeless clinic. They all had the opportunity to come in and teach these new providers in our community what it was like operating in their world. They did clinical rotations at the homeless clinic. They did clinical rotations in the behavioral health center. They did clinical rotations with the congestive heart failure physicians, understanding how the physicians like to manage those patients so they could speak their speak and, quite frankly, have some relationship building opportunities with some of the providers that we were going to be interfacing with. That has to be local. Now, there are some core content that will apply in almost every community. But there are also, depending on what program you're going to do, there's some modules that we've developed and others that will 
kind of cover the bases for a diabetic program, a CHF program, a behavioral health issue, a COPD issue, whatever it is that you're going to be doing. But make sure that you engage your local folks to actually teach those modules because they have to understand and be able to convey to these paramedics or EMTs or nurses or doctors that are going to be providing this for you in your community, how do they navigate these resources in your local community? It doesn't make any sense for your folks to do all of their clinical time in Fort Worth or in Wake or in Eagle or in Pennsylvania because when they get back home, they're going to need to figure out how to integrate with your local healthcare system to make sure that the program is successful. So remember, it, it does, in fact, take a village to do this. Um, the collaborative effort that you're going to put forward to bring people together um, is going to be incredibly important. Case managers. So how many of you have spent any significant time working with case managers? Right? So you know that those are very special people. They have the patience of a saint. Because um, these are very difficult, challenging social issues that they deal with. Um, how many of you have actually spent time in your shelters working with the homeless? All right, there's two kinds of homeless, I figured out, after doing some of this. There's those that just want to be homeless for whatever reason. And there's those that are circumstantial homeless. They don't want to be here, but circumstances have dictated that. And they want to get out of this situation. They want to have good health care. They want to use the system to get themselves out of this rut. So it's sort of interesting when you go through and find all the different things in, this, in, the, in the community that affect all of these people. A lot of them are, are mental health issues. A lot of them are substance abuse issues. Um, and so understanding, having a deeper understanding of that um, really makes these programs um, more successful. But it takes all of those people coming together to do that. You've got to meet monthly to discuss enrolled patients. And that's not just with one facility and then another facility. It's getting everybody to talk about one patient, right? So we, have, we had a patient who was in our system, um, and she, would, she went to one hospital complaining of some head issue, and guess what she got there? A CT scan. Next day, she went to a different hospital, complaining of a head issue. Guess what she got there? A CT scan. The next day, she goes someplace to one of the other hospitals, complains of a head issue. Guess what she gets? This lady glows in the dark. She's easy to find at night. Um, she glows in the dark. When you get all these people around a table and you say, what's going on here? Right? Now, everybody knows about her. So when she shows up now at some place complaining of a headache, she doesn't necessarily get a CT, a CT scan. She gets sent back to where she came from in the first place. Interesting, because they don't always come in by ambulance. They don't always come in by ambulance. Measured the right data. When we talked about the value proposition and getting the commitment for sustained funding, define what success looks like and gather the data that your partner, whether it's a funding partner or others, want to see in order to prove value to them. And it may be different. We had a great breakfast conversation this morning with a couple of other partners in, this, in the country about how do we truly measure some outcomes on these patients. Your different partners may want data a different way. So under one type of program that we have, they want to see utilization data for ER patients and how has it changed over time. Another program, again, might be the hospice program, how many patients successfully got on the elevator at home. For some patients, it, or for some partners, it might be um, how is the patient's outcome in their own perception of a health status different? Maybe it's a combination of those. Make sure you're tracking the right data. We cannot overemphasize enough the concept of patient experience and even in a large respect, provider experience. So one of the scars that we learned is that we had the opportunity we referenced earlier to go to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality on June 28th of 2012, never forget it. We gave a kick-ass presentation all sorts of data, utilization, pre and post, CHF program, CHP program, all these different programs that we were doing, explained it very well. They had profiled our program on their innovation exchange. And when we were done, one of the researchers in the room raised his hand and said, so how do the patients feel about the program? 
And that was kind of our answer because we had never really asked them. Now, we shared that, you know, we think that they liked the program because one patient who, you know, ended up normally dying and, and it wasn't because of any of our interventions, but just through the normal course of life, the family in their request said, hey, in lieu of flowers, send donations to the MedStar Community Health Program. So we have those examples, but we <coughs> didn't have any data. So literally Monday, we started researching, okay, so we need to do patient experience data, we need to do health status data, so we started doing that. So make sure, because again, much of the focus that you've heard over this week is about the patient experience component of the IHI triple aim. You've got to measure patient experience. We took it a step further and wanted to measure the provider. So the case workers that refer patients, the physicians that we interface with, other providers that are part of our integration of the healthcare also have the opportunity to evaluate their experience with the program. So we have yet another data set that we can refer to, how did the providers feel in their experience with the program? So make sure you're doing all of that to make sure that you're tracking data that your partners believe is gonna be beneficial for them. And here's an example of that. So at the top, you'll see that's our health status questionnaire, measures five domains plus their overall assessment of their health status. And we do track patient satisfaction for all of our programs, including the nurse triage program. So a week after a patient goes through the nurse triage program and either got or didn't get an alternative destination, but let's say they got an alternative destination or an alternative outcome, one of our quality assurance people calls that patient or the caller and asks, so tell me about your experience. We've done the clinical QA, but what did you think about the 911 call taking process? What did you think about your interaction with the nurse? Do you, do you feel that she understood your medical complaint? Were you satisfied with the recommendation? Were you satisfied with the transportation? Whatever it was, so that we can have those true experiential data to be able to share with all the partners that we have um, in this entire integration. So this is really all about communicating the right message. You know, one of the things that we learned um, painfully as we went along was that we didn't know the jargon of healthcare. I mean, they, would, they, they think and they talk in a different domain than we do as EMS providers. So it was sort of difficult to go into meetings and have clear understanding of what was really important to them and what we should talk about. You know, we, we always wanted to talk about somehow how this was going to save them money. And it turns out that money is certainly important, but it wasn't really their issue. And so as we learned and, and studied some of this, um, we learned about the, 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 the triple aim of the IHI and, and, and how that is the thing that leads everything in what they do. So we got thinking about our own programs, even our EMS programs. How do they fit into this triple aim? Do what we do every day improve patient outcomes? And how do we know? How do we prove that? What's the value equation for that? Because it's important. You may not think today that it's important because it hasn't been the issue. But coming down the pike, just like it has for hospitals and physicians and other healthcare workers, is going to be this question of value. MedPAC's already sort of put out there this issue relative to BLS ambulances and the reimbursement for that, and that it really brings no value. That question is already sort of floating out there. It's just a matter of time before we are having to answer those questions. The number one spend on Part B right now for Medicare is what? Ambulances. So when you become the number one of something, ask Durable Medical what happened to them when they became the number one spend. You get scrutinized. It's going to happen to our market. Look at the fraud and abuse that exists in ambulance stuff. So in our market, we have one dialysis patient that we transport. Where the mobile integrated healthcare paramedics go out and see that patient, touch that patient. Every 30 days they do that to make sure what? They're medically necessary. We have one that we transport. And we do all the transports in our service area. Go to Houston. Population is a little more, right? We're about a million. They're about, you know, I don't know, eight million. Go to Austin. They're about a million. They have one dialysis patient that they transport. In Houston, they have thousands, thousands 
of dialysis patients that they transport. So either the water there is just really, really bad, or there's something really funky going on in Houston. Right? They have, I don't know, 400, 400 to 600 ambulance services. Because there's no barriers to entry in Texas for opening up an ambulance service. All you've got to have is the money for the license and someone who at some point was certified and a medical director sign off on it. You're in business. They start up and shut down every day in Houston. Fraud and abuse. It's getting lots of uh, notoriety in Texas, but also on the federal level. So yes, we're going to come under scrutiny. Um, And it's all going to be about how we prove this this value equation that we've put out there. I want to go back to the, the previous slide. Not, not that one, the one before that. That, you know, there's also this issue in our, our area about data. So how do you document today? Right? It's incident-based, right? So if you have an EPCR, every time you have an incident, it creates a report for that incident. Well, mobile health care requires a medical record. You have to have an ability to see what happened to the patient yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. And it doesn't exist anywhere in our systems, um, our standard systems today. All we have is this electronic patient care reporting. So even getting the data elements that we knew, we had to create our own EMR um, out of uh, SharePoint in order to get that done. But it's very rudimentary, hard to get data out of, hard to report stuff back. We have to work as an industry to change that picture. And it doesn't matter if you're making a 911 call or you're making a mobile health care call. You know, if you've been to that resident before, it would be helpful for the paramedic to know what you were there for, what their last EKG was like, what meds that were they on, what's changed about them, what happened last time. Wouldn't you agree? As opposed to every encounter being a new encounter. Sorry. No, it's a great, great point. One thing that actually we hadn't talked about. Um, the, the outcome discussion. So be very careful. And we've heard through this conference, most of the questions have been about money. People from the audience and folks that stopped us in the hallway have asked about how do we get paid, how do we get paid, how do we get paid. Please, please, please make sure that when you leave this room, when you have these discussions with each other, in your community, wherever it is, the very first question you should ask and the way that you refer to it is, how can we improve the patient's outcome? Because we now are in a mode in our community that we are getting paid for these things and we are getting systems in place to make sure that we're capturing the revenue that we can through the programs, there are times when we hear that people may think that this is for us about the money. We have to make a better effort at reminding folks this is about improving a patient's outcome. When Doug mentioned we did the media briefings, every media outlet, when they did their broadcast stories, when they did their print stories, the very first thing those reporters talked about was this is going to improve patient's outcome. When we met with the city councils, we're going to improve the experience of care for the patient, and here's how we're going to do it. Oh, and by the way, we're going to make more resources available for the rest of the community. Focus on the patient outcome because, A, it's 100% true. That is what we're trying to do. If you can improve the patient's outcome, everything else is a byproduct of that, including the economics. Right. Absolutely. Doug? So we can't encourage you enough. So we've spent four and a half years doing this. There's other people who have spent time, energy, and effort to create programs. The amazing thing about this Most of them are all willing to work with you um, to help you create your programs. You don't have to recreate the wheel. So for you, you don't have to start at the beginning. You get to start someplace at the middle or maybe even towards the end of the program. If you don't have a training program, there are training programs out there that you can get and use. There are folks that will come and help you do the gap analysis and all the other issues that might exist. Reach out to people. Let them help you get your program started. And especially with data, uh, Doug and I have had the blessing of going all over the country 
with experience and data to present to hospitals, payer groups, community groups, and trust us. When you have folks that come in that have ridden the unicorn, it changes the conversation in your community. When you come out to MedStar or other places and do a day or two day site visit and ride with the mobile health care practitioner, sit in the call center with the nurse, talk to patients, see what it is that we're doing. When you go back home and you say, well, when we were at X and we talked to these patients, here's what they told us. It's a total different conversation than when you're having a conversation with your hospitals or your, your local folks says, well, I read this article, I went to this conference, and here's what they said. Totally different discussion. So take advantage of those things so that you can speed down the uh, racetrack in a much faster, faster uh, fashion, because you'll hear why in just a moment. Yeah, and, and when your CNO at the hospital is listening to this, and you can refer her to a CNO at some other hospital, so it's not coming from you, it's coming from a CNO who operates inside one of these systems, it makes all the difference in the world. Because it's, it's getting validated that what you're saying is true. Don't wait. We have helped a number of organizations and some very large national ambulance providers with this project. Someone in your community is having a conversation about managing post-acute care patients, managing high utilizers. I guarantee you. It may be happening inside the hospital alone. It may be happening with that hospital and another company that's going to charge them to do this. It may be happening with, you name it, it may be happening with another provider of emergency medical services in your community. We've had 109 communities come to MedStar in the last two and a half, three years from 39 states and six foreign countries to learn about this program. It is possible that someone from your community has already been to our place to learn. If you are late to come to the table to have a discussion with someone, they don't know about you. They know about the other guy or the other agency, or if they don't know about anybody, they're hiring people internally to do this. If you've been waiting for a sign, this is it. Use this conference as a reason to go back and Monday morning start calling people in your market and your local community and saying, hey, I just came back from a conference and I heard about this stuff. Can I share with you what I learned? And let's see if there's something we can maybe partner in. It's a great way to open some doors and to have some early dialogue. Yeah, let me, and let me just, so I can just give you some tangible examples of that. We were in a, in a market where um, a hospital system was very interested in doing this program. So they went to their local provider, which just happened to be a fire service, and the fire chief said, no thanks, not really interested. Um, they reached back out to us and said, so I went to the fire chief, because we referred them to the fire chief, and, uh, and they said, so now what? And we said, well, do it yourself, right? So guess what? They now get into the mobile health care business and start providing these services themselves with paramedics. Does that create a chink in the armor of anybody's franchise? Yes, because they're now bringing value to who is almost always the most influential person in your community, right? It's the health care system. They employ thousands of people provide valued services, they have a big voice. So don't ignore this. You can, anybody in this room can start small and do something. Remembering the focus on the patient, and we're going to open up for Q&A here um, just after this, but remember that a very famous philosopher, who you may all know, said, Unless it's someone like you, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, meaning caring about the patient, nothing is going to get better. It is not. Who, what famous philosopher said that? So remember, everything that you've heard, focus on the patient, don't wait, focus on the patient, figure out what the gaps are, focus on the patient, figure out how to make it sustainable, all those things as you leave here. Any final thoughts before the Q&A there, Mr. Hooten? No, I mean, I, you know, Dr. Garza said it really well. I mean, this is sort of an evolutionary change in our industry. We're all sort of on the front line of that right now. We can choose to ignore it um, as an industry. Um, and we will, some of us, will end up going the way of the dinosaur. Somebody will come in and replace you 
as a provider in your community because they're willing to do more and bring more value um, to the health care equation every single day. You have resource, you have infrastructure, it's paid for. How do you maximize that? How do you take advantage of that? You have communication centers, you have all kinds of resources that are there 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, able to respond quickly to an event. You have trained people that you spent thousands of dollars training. Doesn't it just make sense? You have capacity, because nobody's running a 1-0 utilization. Most people are running in the threes. It means you have 70% capacity to do something else. Think about this. It's not rocket science. You're doing it every day anyway. You're sending trucks out, you're assessing patients, and you're leaving them on scene. Add the component of navigating them someplace else. That's it. It's not hard. Let someone help you. You don't have to be alone.